It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. On behalf of New Democrats, I would also like to welcome His Eminence Cardinal Collins to the leg Legislature and all those folks that are here advocating for Catholic education. Uh, my first question, Speaker, is to the Acting Premier. Yesterday, families in Oshawa received devastating news about GM's plans to shut down operations. Speaking on behalf of Conservatives in Ottawa, Andrew Scheer said, quote, Conservatives aren't prepared to throw in the towel on this. Can the Acting Premier explain why Conservatives in Queen's Park are ready to, to do exactly that? The Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Economic Development. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Well, thanks uh, very much uh, for the question this morning, Mr. Speaker. It has uh, been a difficult 24-48 uh, hours uh, for the folks in Oshawa and in the Durham region. There's no question about that. This news hit hard. Uh, that's why uh, Premier Ford and uh, Ministers Bethlen Falvey and Phillips and a number of other members from the Durham region uh, went to Oshawa last night to meet with uh, the outgoing mayor, John Henry, and the incoming mayor, uh, Dan Carter, and uh, members of the the Chamber of Commerce to talk about how we can provide supports as the province of Ontario for that region which is being hit so hard in a global restructuring that, uh, and I have to reiterate this, it's a global restructuring and when asked uh, by the Premier if we could do anything to keep that Oshawa facility up and running. On numerous occasions, we asked the question, Spons. Mr. Speaker. Uh, General Motors has answered the decisions are final, and unfortunately, uh, those lines will be moving out of Ontario. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, for thousands of families in Oshawa, losing GM means losing their livelihood, and they're not willing to give that up without a fight. But the Premier's message to them yesterday was, quote, it's over, it's done, that ship has sailed. How can the government declare that the fight for jobs is over when they threw in the towel before it even begun? Minister. Well, thanks again uh, for the question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've been on the ground in Oshawa. We met with the mayors uh, and uh, the regional council, soon to be chair of the regional council, and uh, members of the Chamber of Commerce to talk about uh, next steps so that we can continue to make Ontario open for business, so that we can ensure that the Durham region reaps the rewards of the changes that we're making in Ontario so we can bring good-paying jobs to the Durham region. There are a lot of different things that we're going to be exploring as the new government to ensure sure that the people of Oshawa, that the people of Durham land on their feet, that we see new investment in those employment lands and employment lands along the 400 series of highways. Oshawa is in a great position, Mr. Speaker, to see a brand new investment in that community, great jobs that are going to support the families in the Durham Response. region and working together with the leadership in Durham region, working with the Chamber of Commerce and Nancy Shaw and her team. We're going to make the Durham region rise again, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, when I spoke to the new mayor, he was crystal clear he wants to fight for jobs. The workers at GM are even clearer. I quote, they are not closing our damn plant without one hell of a fight. That's what the workers are saying. Even the Conservative MP for Durham says, and I quote, we owe it to the workers and their families to explore what can be done to preserve Oshawa as an automotive hub. But when Oshawa looks to the Premier of this province for hope, all they see is, it's over, it's done. When is this government going to show some leadership, bring together workers, municipal leaders, auto parts and other supply chain businesses and start working on a plan to keep these good jobs in Oshawa? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you one thing we won't be doing is grandstanding on the backs here, of people who just lost their here, jobs. Here, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, when Premier Ford and our team were standing out in front of the Pickering, Pickering Nuclear Station earlier this summer, making sure that we were committed to saving 7,500 jobs at that facility, where was the NDP? Here, here. They want to close down here, here. the nuclear here, facility here. in Pickering, Mr. Speaker. We're going to do everything that we can to ensure that we have good-paying jobs on the ground, and that's why we've made the changes that we have made. I don't know what the leader of the NDP wants us to do. Does she want us to nationalize auto jobs? 
in Canada? Is that what she wants? You know, we are going to provide the supports that the workers on the ground in Oshawa need. We're response. there. The Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities has her rapid response team on the ground to make sure we're helping those who need us at this time of need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the uh, uh, Deputy Premier. Uh, but I have to say, it's not about what I want, Speaker. It's what the workers in Oshawa want, and they want fighters. They want fighters to stand up for them, not a government that gives up and walks away from the concerns that these families have. Yesterday, General Motors said it's, uh, uh, that it's global, uh, its goal in global restructuring was to focus on electric vehicles to transition to a low-carbon economy. They're scrambling to catch up where they see the auto industry going, to catch up to where the industry is going. The Premier's plan for electric cars seems to consist of scrapping incentives that encourage innovation and fighting electric car makers in court. Why is the government moving Ontario out of this sector exactly when car makers are looking to break into it? Deputy Premier. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Well, uh, again, Mr. Speaker, it, uh, it just uh, speaks to the knowledge of what is actually happening on the ground uh, from, the, from the leader of the official opposition. Uh, we're actually removing red tape in the industry, Mr. Speaker. We're removing red tape that is going to allow for technology advancements in Ontario, and that includes uh, in the automotive sector, Mr. Speaker. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, General Motors is making a significant investment in the technology uh, centre that they have in Mar Markham. There's 500 jobs there now. General Motors plans to create 1,000 jobs here, here. at that Markham facility, Mr. Speaker. And one of the reasons that they're doing that is because the Ontario government is getting out of the way and removing some of the barriers and the red tape that exists in that sector. The, 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 the NDP seems to want to give those on the ground a false sense of Response. hope. I would say that that false sense of hope from the leader of the NDP is disingenuous at best, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. The minister will withdraw his unparliamentary comment. Notwithstanding the way that the government's deciding to respond to this, smart government policy has been crucial in making the auto sector the linchpin of Ontario's economy for decades. But the Premier has shunned the idea of an auto strategy and denounced job-creating government investments in industries like the auto sector. Instead, he proposes no-string-detached corporate tax giveaways that go to companies even when they lay people off by the thousands. Given the announcement in Oshawa yesterday, does this government Government really believe that this plan is working? Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, we are doing everything that we possibly can here in the government of Ontario to ensure that we're creating an environment in, pro in this province for, for investments, uh, for investments in our auto sector, for investments in our manufacturing sector. And I don't know how the leader of the NDP can stand there with a straight face and ask these questions when what they're looking to do is put up barriers, increase costs, corporate tax increases, jacking up carbon taxes in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. They supported the Liberal order. government hand in glove when electricity prices have soared through the roof to some of the highest in North America, Mr. Speaker. They supported them on Bill 148, Mr. Speaker, a job killer here in Ontario. They are guilty, Mr. Speaker, as an accomplice to that terrible Liberal government that we've had for the last 15 years. It's impossible to take these questions with any seriousness. Order. Government side will come to order. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Over the last 24 hours, I've had the chance to speak with union leadership and Oshawa's new mayor and our MPP for Oshawa has been on the ground meeting with workers and families tirelessly. They all agree with what industry experts and parts suppliers have been telling me for a long time. Ontario needs an auto strategy, especially if we're going to fight to save jobs in Oshawa. Why is the government sitting on their hands without a plan? 
Minister. Mr. Speaker, our plan is to ensure that Ontario is open for business, and that's for auto manufacturers, that's for all manufacturers, that's for the technology sector. And I can tell you today, Mr. Speaker, that although we got some devastating news, and I appreciate uh, the member from Oshawa and the way she's been standing with her community and standing up for her community uh, in a respectful way, Mr. Speaker, we have brought forward, and, and we. And I, and I do want to say that we really do want to work hand-in-hand hand with the uh, member from Oshawa who has uh, been at the heart of these job losses over the last uh, couple of days and ensure that the supports are there from the provincial government for those people on the ground in the Durham region, along with uh, all of my colleagues who represent uh, ridings in the Durham region, Mr. Speaker. But what we're doing is creating an environment Response. in Ontario for job creation. We're seeing a facility that just had the ribbon cut today, 1,450 jobs in the London area. I just opened a facility, 800 jobs here in downtown Toronto this morning. We're making a difference. Thank you. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. My next question is also to the Deputy Leader. The families facing job, loss in, uh, job losses in Oshawa need a government with a plan to bring the jobs of tomorrow here That's to right. Ontario. That's the point. They need a serious strategy backed with investments designed to create and keep good jobs in Canada. They need a government ready to fight for Oshawa. Instead, they have a premier whose plan for jobs consists of overpriced road signs, discounted beer, and telling Oshawa families that there's no point in fighting for their jobs. Does the act Premier understand that this is just not good enough. Yeah. Deputy Premier. Minister of Economic Development. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Mr. Speaker, it's really hard to take these questions seriously. Given yeah, what yeah. we've been doing for the That's last right. five months here in the legislature, we're opening Ontario up for business. You know, if we if we continued Order. on the path that we were on, Mr. Speaker, we would have the highest carbon tax in North America if that party had their way. The, the elevating the, the soaring cost of electricity would continue to be outrageous if this party had their way. They wanted to kill 7,500 jobs in the nuclear sector and Pickering, the low-cost, reliable form of electricity coming out of the Durham region, yeah, Mr. Speaker. Campaign. The NDP would have killed 7,500 jobs. Here they are, standing up. Uh, you know, and, and we do feel, certainly, for the people on the ground in Oshawa, but they're talking out of both sides of their mouth in the official opposition, Mr. Speaker, and I'll withdraw. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You can take your seat. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, notwithstanding the fallacies that this government continues to spread, the women and men who are facing catastrophic job losses in Oshawa need a government that's ready to step up to the plate and help them keep their jobs. Instead, we have a government that's asleep at the switch. Instead of shrugging their shoulders and throwing in the towel, will this government join with the workers, municipal leaders, local businesses and concerned citizens who are ready to actually fight this decision and start working? Working on a plan to keep those good jobs in Oshawa. Minister. Well, apparently the leader of the NDP didn't hear my answers earlier because we are working with all of the individuals here, here. that uh, the member just said. We've been in constant communication, first of all, with the company. We've been in constant communication with our federal counterparts. We've been in uh, communication with leadership on the ground, including the outgoing mayor, who will soon be the regional chair, Mr. Henry, and the incoming mayor of Oshawa, uh, Mr. Carter. We met with them last night. We've met with Nancy Shaw, who's the CEO of the Oshawa Chamber of Commerce. We've talked with our counterparts in the region, uh, the member from Oshawa, Jennifer French, to uh, ensure that she knows what's happening from the provincial point of view, our Minister of Training, Colleges, University, our Order. Minister of the Treasury Board, our Minister of Environment, uh, local MPPs, uh, Park and, and Co and Smith and Pacini. We were all there last night in a show of solidarity yeah, yeah. to build a plan so that we can bring Oshawa back up onto its feet because it is going to do well, not under false premise, but with a real plan. And that I'm going to ask the minister once again to withdraw his unparliamentary comment. Sorry, withdraw. False allegations. Withdraw. Next question, 
Member for Durham. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. And I want to thank the Minister and the Premier for coming to Oshawa last night. <laughs> Yesterday was a hard day for a lot of my constituents and across Durham Region. For many, a General Motors is a part of the family tree. For years, workers did everything they, they could to keep the plant open. However, yesterday, the Wall Street Journal summarized the problem when it said, Canada is among the most expensive countries in the world to build cars and the highest cost market for car assembly in the North America free trade zone. Speaker, can the minister tell the House what our government is doing to make Ontario more competitive and bring businesses to Ontario? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Uh, and that's a great question, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from Durham for the question this morning. I want to stress that what the member stated is absolutely correct. Time and time again, Canadian auto workers at General Motors were measured as the most efficient and the most effective on the continent. But this is a global marketplace, and it's not enough for our workers to compete. We have to compete as a province, Mr. Speaker, and for 15 years, we just didn't. But in the last six months, this government has repealed Bill 148. The finance minister has worked to create a lower tax rate and accelerate capital cost depreciation here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. The energy Member minister Waterloo, is on a crusade to undo the last decade of destruction that made energy poverty a reality, not just for people on the ground, but for our business community in Ontario as well. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is going to be competitive. That's how we bring business here, and that's how we're going to keep good jobs here in Ontario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supplementary. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for his answer. For Davenport. Back in May, the CEO of Magna had this to say about the auto sector in Ontario. I get very frustrated when I see the decisions being made that put undue administrative costs and inefficiencies on our plants, specifically here in Ontario, because we have to compete. We're not going to get business if we're forced to be uncompetitive. I'm glad our government is taking the challenges faced by the auto sector seriously, but some challenges, like tariffs, require the cooperation of the federal government in order to keep plants open here in Ontario. Can the minister update the House on our efforts to fight tariffs and protect Ontario's auto sector? Minister. Speaker, the member uh, from Durham has highlighted an important part of the equation here, and that is the aluminum and steel tariffs that remain in place even after the signing of the USMCA. The average car crosses the border seven times before it's fully assembled, and tariffs on steel make life harder for parts manufacturers and car manufacturers to do their jobs. Since coming to government on June 29th, Ontario has sent deputations to the United States congressional committees. We've worked with state governments and our county counterparts there. And just a couple of weeks ago, I had a great conversation with the American ambassador, Kelly Kraft, to There's talk about our trading order. relationship with the United States and how important that is on both sides of the border. We're calling on the federal government, Mr. Speaker, to press the Americans to lift Section 232. Those are the tariffs on steel and aluminum, because keeping them in Spons. place, Mr. Speaker, is harming our auto manufacturing on both, both sides, sides of the border. It's a win-win to remove those tariffs. Yeah. For the U.S. and for us here in Ontario. Thank you. Next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, my question is to the acting premier. As everyone in this room knows, yesterday my community was rocked by the news that GM is intending to close operations in Oshawa. Oshawa Carriage Works started in Oshawa 140 years ago, became the cornerstone of GM, and GM Canada just celebrated 100 years in Oshawa. I was there. We have a long, uh, a long story of commitment, and this is devastating news. Uh, words cannot express how my community is feeling, but they are feeling, you know, Oshawa didn't build GM. Oh, excuse me. Yes, it did. Oshawa built GM from the beginning. It was a dream and an idea, and they now can have a global conversation because of their community start. 
This government talks about wanting to create good jobs. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of them in Oshawa, and once they're gone, they're gone forever. The people of Oshawa are feeling abandoned by their employer. They don't want to feel abandoned by their government. And to find out that the Premier comes in, you know, in the, in, after dinner time and has a huge meeting with all of the folks, but none of them from Labour. And I would have brought my own chair had I been invited. I was in Oshawa all day and would love to have a conversation with this government. So the conversation that I want, the question I want to know now is, will this government talk to workers? Will this government uh, protect these jobs before it's too late? The Deputy Premier. Of economic development, job creation, and trade. Thanks, Speaker, and thanks to the uh, Deputy Premier as well. Um, and, and thanks to the member uh, from Oshawa for the question uh, this morning. I can only imagine how difficult it is for her losing uh, these kinds of jobs that have been there for literally a century in Oshawa. I had the opportunity to speak to the member yesterday morning, along with the member from London West, to uh, update them on how uh, things were proceeding and the messages that we had been getting from uh, both GM Canada and GM Global. I know that uh, the Premier had an opportunity to talk to uh, Labour uh, uh, over the last couple of days uh, with Mr. Dias uh, and, and Unifor and, uh, and talk about what this means uh, for the Labour force in Oshawa and express to him uh, certainly our displeasure with the decisions that were made by GM, but to also explain that we had asked GM if there was anything we could possibly do to reverse this decision that's part of a global restructuring. This wasn't a knee-jerk reaction. Certainly, we've seen that eight plants across uh, well, North America and around the world are closing as a result of this. Our commitment is, is that our team is going to work with folks on the ground in Oshawa, including the member opposite, to ensure we have a positive outcome for the Oshawa region. Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Speaker. Um, I want to let everyone in my community and in this House know that I'm, I'm not going to give up the fight to keep these jobs in Oshawa where they belong. Yesterday, yesterday was an unbelievably challenging day, um, and we have many ahead of us. I spent time with the workers who are my friends, they're my neighbours, um, and we're reeling. We are reeling. <clears throat> Our community. Our community, no, 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 no. <laughs> I got to get this out. Our community is building fantastic vehicles and wants to continue to do that work and to have those great jobs. On the day, though, that we get the news of a closure on the horizon, it was really tough to not only get that news but get hear the premier announce that after one conversation with GM Canada, that the ship has left the dock. The premier jumped straight to damage control and skipped right over the year that we have until December 2019, and that is like tapping out before you even get in the ring. We want a premier and a government that is willing to fight to protect our jobs, not to fold like a cheap suit. And so Oshawa will fight to protect our jobs. We invite the province to stand alongside us. And, Speaker, will this premier stand with workers and fight to keep good jobs in Ontario and Oshawa? Minister. Uh, speaker, uh, thanks for the question, and uh, I, I certainly do understand uh, how upsetting and disappointing and heartbreaking this is for families right across the Durham region. And uh, the premier said so yesterday as well. Uh, this is such a stressful time uh, for families, especially heading into the Christmas period. Uh, you know, we are doing everything that we can as the government of Ontario to ensure that General Motors continues to have a significant presence in Ontario. Uh, they do have the CAMI facility in Ingersoll. They have the engine plant Opposition in St. Catharines, the technology centre in Markham and in Oshawa. The headquarters is going to remain in Oshawa. We want to ensure that we have that relationship so that we can see further expansion Opposition from General Gumbauer. Motors and that the workers in, at General Motors now. Uh, you know, one of the lines is shutting down in June. The other two lines are to shut down or have unallocated uh, resources at the end of, of December. We're doing everything that we can to support those people on the ground Response. and ensure that we can have new jobs and new hope for the people in Oshawa with our plan to make Ontario open for business, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and University. I and many Ontarians were saddened to learn of the planned closure of the General Motors plant in Oshawa. I know that this will impact thousands of families in Oshawa, the GTA, and Eastern Ontario. 
many of whom, Speaker, have worked at GM for years and have become highly trained professional workers. These are people who take pride in their work and know that it's crucial that they return to the workforce as soon as possible. Many of the affected workers will need help to learn new skills to rejoin the workforce in a newly highly skilled position. Can the minister tell us what this government is doing to ensure that the workers at GM will have the supports they need to reskill and find another job? Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the member from Whitby for that question. Speaker, first I want to express my sympathy for the thousands of families who will be affected by the closure at GM. When the government learned about the planned closure, Premier Ford and I directed officials to reach out to GM as quickly as possible and initiate the Rapid Reemployment Training Services Program. And under that program, my, minister, my ministry will be in regular contact with, the GM, with GM and ensure that they and their employees have the information for the, and training for, about training services Member provided for by our North, government. Governor. I will make sure that services and training necessary are readily available so that impacted employees can rejoin the workforce as soon as possible. No doubt there will be difficult times Response. ahead, but I can assure the member and the affected families that they have my commitment. That we will be there for them to help them get back on their feet. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that thoughtful response. I'm happy to hear that our government is already getting involved through this Rapid Reemployment Training Services Program and asking all levels of government to work together to help impacted families with the support, assistance, and relief they need. Many of the workers will need help to learn new skills to rejoin the workforce in a newly highly skilled position. However, Speaker, there are some people calling on the government to do more to reverse this unfortunate business decision by General Motors, which is affecting plants in the United States as well as the Oshawa GM plant. Can the Minister of Labour explain what else our government has done to provide assistance to the workers affected by the plant closure in 219? Minister. She has to refer. Oh, minister sorry, of Training, minister. Colleges and Universities. Sorry, to the Minister of Labour. Referred to the Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Whitby for the question and express my sympathy for all the families who will be impacted by this planned GM closure. Member for In Timmins, my riding come of door. Halliburton, Port the Lakes, Brock, I know hundreds member of people who, come work, who have worked or have retired from the Oshawa Assembly plant, and I can reassure the members that our government has acted quickly to find ways to assist those workers that have been impacted by this planned closure. Under the leadership of our Premier Ford, our government has asked the federal government to immediately extend employment insurance eligibility by five weeks to a maximum of 50 weeks in the impacted EI regions. We've also asked the federal government to extend the duration of work sharing agreements by an additional 38 weeks to a total of 76 weeks and allow for immediate reapplication for expired agreements. Our government is taking these measures to ensure our impacted workers in the auto sector can fully access EI benefits when they need them most. Mr. Speaker, we are there for the families and the workers impacted. Thank you. Next question. The member for Kiwetanong. Um, my question is, uh, for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. A big part of uh, the provincial advocate for children and youth uh, advocacy role is addressing systemic issues uh, impacting First Nations children and youth. The act it itself um, highlights the need to pay attention to First Nations children. This is particularly uh, important uh, to the people in the far north where uh, in 2017, we lost uh, 38 children and youth to suicide. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, the question is, without access to a provincial uh, child advocate today, who will First Nations children and families reach out to when the system is failing them? 
or when they are falling through the cracks. Thank you, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much for the question, Miigwech. Uh, I appreciated the opportunity to, uh, to rise today to talk about what our government is doing in order to strengthen accountability in the Children's Aid Societies as well as those uh, for children in, in custody uh, across the province of Ontario. Our most vulnerable children deserve better, and we will be holding those responsible for those children to a higher standard and a stronger accountability mechanism by ensuring that there's an investigative unit within the Ombudsman's Office that is dedicated to children. It will be turn Order. Key, but there's more that we're going to be doing as a government. We are committed to improving the outcomes of Ontario's child protection system through the creation of three new type tables dedicated to sharing ideas of empowerment that work. Started last week. We're going to continue Opposition to move to forward. And I'm pleased, and I'll talk more about it in the supplemental, but we will ensure that there will be an Indigenous-led table. Uh, and I will be happy Spons. to consult the member opposite, as well as the Minister of Indigenous affairs as we move forward with this new model. Supplementary. Question is to the, uh, the Minister of Children, Youth and Social Service again. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, tables are fine, but they are no substitute uh, to having an independent office of this legislature exactly. to advocate for and with our, with our youth. That's what the Feathers of Hope initiative is. That's what the independent advocate did when, uh, when there was an inquest into seven youth deaths who died in Thunder Bay. Without an independent child advocate mandated to focus on First Nations children and youth, how will Ontario ensure that the children of Akiwet Nook and others from the far north are given every opportunity to grow and flourish? Thank you. <laughs> Members, take your seat. Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. Again, I appreciate the, the question from the member opposite. Look, we are moving towards a stronger, more robust accountability mechanism for those who may seek to harm children and who are not there. Uh, we are ensuring that the Ombudsman, who is the chief investigator uh, in this area now, uh, that he will have the opportunity to pursue uh, more child protection mechanisms while ensuring that there is an advocacy component within our office. I want to make it very clear to the members opposite who do not understand the difference between what, uh, what investigation components and oversight are as opposed to order. what advocacy is. Last year alone, the Ombudsman received 367 Position complaints from the Children's Aid Society, and he had to refer them to, uh, to the child Member advocate who didn't have a strong and investigative component. So that's Member why Hamilton, with the new expanded... The Ombudsman's expanded oversight capabilities will remain and that we will ensure that there are going to be greater child protection Response. systems. But I want to be perfectly clear, any report that's been done or pending by the child advocate will be sent over to the uh, Ombudsman for greater oversight and accountability, and we're going to take action immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Orléans. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of the Service is for uh, the uh, Minister of the Elderly. This morning, uh, she's here at the Provincial Council of Women of Ontario, who lives with very limited means and needs to, to be supported by her brother. I've spoken with many seniors uh, in the community of Orleans and across the province who are actually unsure about what the fall economic statement mean about their finances and their future. They are worried that this government will not be there for them and when they need it most. Speaker, as some of you know, I used to own a retirement residence. I understand the aging process well, and I know how it affects families. Mr. Speaker, does the minister and his government believe in supporting seniors whose population is expected to double by 2041. Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the very important question. I'd like to refer your question to the Minister of Social Services, Children. Sir, Children, Community and Social Services. I want to applaud the minister responsible for accessibility and seniors. He's doing a tremendous job on behalf of them. And I believe, in fact, he is the oldest cabinet minister in uh, Ontario history. 
So congratulations to you. Look, the fall economic statement was very clear on how we're going to uh, support those who are on limited income with the lift program that our Minister of Finance rolled out. And then this past week, we were we were prepared to uh, roll out more changes on social assistance so that the Ontario's most vulnerable will have a pathway to uh, to getting out of poverty rather than sticking in. And Speaker, I just want to point out to the member opposite, during the time that her government was in office, one in seven Ontarians were struggling in poverty, and they were stuck there. What we are offering as a government is a multi-ministerial approach where we work together as the Minister of Health, the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Housing, the Minister of Education, the Minister responsible for seniors, the Minister responsible for the Attorney General. We're working together because we recognize that each individual in Ontario needs to be lifted up the best they possibly can. Thank you. Supplementary. So, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the minister. I'm quite disappointed the actual Minister of Seniors Affairs couldn't stand up and speak on seniors' issue. Um, maybe like the Minister of Francophone Affairs, actually. Uh, well, what I can tell you is the seniors I spoke with don't only want to be looked at through the lens of health care or any other. They're not feeling supported by this government. They are concerned about the lift tax plan that does not apply to low-income pensioners. They've been told it only applies to employment income. This means this tax credit is not going to be helping many people in one of the fastest growing groups of the population of Ontario. Speaker, senior wants to participate and contribute actively to their communities. So does the minister really think that a single senior, sometimes, and I would say in the vast majority, women who have outlived their spouses, earning under $30,000 a year in pension Question. income, does not deserve support? Minister. Speaker, this government has all been about supporting the people of Ontario since we took office. We are reversing some of the most damaging damaging policies that Liberal government put forward, including in social assistance, where for 15 years they operated a disjointed patchwork system that kept one in seven people living in poverty, including seniors in this province. That's why the, for the first time in over 15 years, this government brought in across the board 1.5 percent increase in Ontario Works and ODSP. Order. That's why this government is going to create better wraparound support for those who are on ODSP and Ontario Works. That's why this government is going to be putting more people back to work by supporting them and not ignoring them and empowering them and making sure that there's dignity in the situation, which is opposition something, by the order. way, during the 13 years I sat in opposition over there, watched them squander. Shame on them. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. Start the clock. Next question. Member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. I know our government for the people has been working hard to improve the lives of everyone who calls Ontario home. We are cutting red tape, making responsible investments, and making sure that we get our economy going again. Mr. Speaker, 15 years of the Liberal government has made it a very difficult task, but I know our colleagues, my colleagues and I are, are, are up to the job. We are investing in local businesses that help communities grow. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell the members of this House about how our government is working for Northern Ontario businesses? The Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question for the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. A strong advocate not only for Perry Sound, Muskoka, but for the entire region of Northern Ontario. You know, we have a premier and a caucus that wants to ensure that Northern Ontario is as much open for business as any part of this province. They know that what we can contribute when we make targeted and strategic investments. But as well, Mr. Speaker, ensure that it doesn't take seven years for a mine to open, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, yeah. to ensure that by reducing red tape, our forestry sector and our mining sector has a chance to respond to the market today, Mr. Speaker. And that's why we're moving ahead with so many di different initiatives across the region, opening up 
up Northern Ontario for business, getting ad addressing the Far North Act because it has made little progress to collaborate with First Nations communities or negotiating a deal that would keep Algoma Steel uh, in Sault Ste. Marie. Thank goodness for the member of Sault Ste. Marie and his hard work in that community for protecting jobs and keeping Northern Ontario open for business. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the Minister for his work on these files and his for support for Northern Ontario. There is no doubt that our government is doing everything it can to ensure we create economic prosperity right across our province. The members of this House are well aware of the important investments our government has continued to make to support this goal. Last week, I was very pleased to announce one of these investments in my riding of Perry Sound, Muskoka. Our government announced $968,000 investment to build a multi-purpose centre in Carling to host community activities and private functions. Wow. This investment provides a much-needed space for families to gather and host special events. Can the minister please tell the members of this House more about how this investment will benefit the community of Carling and area? Minister. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, uh, we're making the kind of targeted investments that make sense in northern communities. We have a lot of small towns, isolated and remote indigenous communities, and some bigger cities that are not to the scale of the ones down here in southern Ontario. And our great northern Ontario gang out, out here, we know where those investments are because we work closely with those community members. Even for ridings that we are, there's no progressive conservative member for now, Mr. Speaker, we continue to make sure that they're connected and that we're investing in the projects that matter. This particular one was a 9,443 square foot facility uh, to host family gatherings, conferences, business uh, functions, and serve as an emergency uh, shelter. It's a fully licensed commercial com kitchen, which will help support training and host larger uh, events. We congratulate the town of Carling, their outstanding member of provincial yeah, parliament yeah, yeah. from Muskoka Perry Sound. Boss. And the projects like it, Mr. Speaker, the fall economic statement will continue to uh, support for Northern Ontario. Let's just hope the Northern Ontario caucus over there. Thank you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Order. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Timmins. My question is for uh, the Francophone, Minister Francophone, Francophone Affairs. You know, Mr. Ford's government decided to close uh, the uh, Office of the Francophone Affairs and to cancel the construction of the French University as a Francophone, as a citizen, as an individual. You, as an individual, as a Francophone, who is proud to be it, do you support that decision? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government showed Friday night with our announcements our willingness to work for francophones and with the francophones to move forward the francophone issues. With respect to the Office of the Francophone Affairs, we were very clear that the, our government will make amendments to Bill 57 to make sure that we create a position as a commissioner within the Ombudsman's Office. We will find a way to protect the rights of francophones, linguistic rights, but by uh, protecting the money of our taxpayers. The Ombudsman will be responsible for the investigations and to give the reports here, and uh, will keep the function of uh, making up these recommendations and to improve the affairs. I'm asking the member not to politicize this decision. We will make sure that linguistic rights be preserved while preserving the taxpayers' money. Supplementary. Madam Minister, this is very political, very political. You come from, a Mul you come from the Mulroney family, who's a proud Francophone, a prime minister who worked for the Francophone Affairs. And I'm asking you a question as a Francophone, not as a minister, as a Francophone of Ontario, do you support the decision of closing those uh, 
those uh, decisions here in Ontario, yes or no? Once again, I'll remind all members to make their comments through the chair. Minister. Merci, Monsieur le Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, I am very proud of what my father did for Canada, for Francophones in Canada. What he did for Francophones in Canada served all Canadians, and what we're doing in Ontario will benefit all Ontarians, including Franco-Ontarians. As, Fran as a proud Francophone, I can tell you that the changes that we proposed at the Office of the Francophone Affairs we will continue to preserve linguistic rights in Ontario, and with respect to the uh, French University, we will continue to working on that important project for Franco-Ontarians. It is a project that is for and by Francophones, with a deficit of $15 billion and a debt of $350 million. billion. Mr. Speaker, for all Ontarians, including Franco-Ontarians, and once we will uh, be doing this work. We will work on this project. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Next question. Member for Simcoe North. Sure. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Our government members are aware of the disdain that the previous Liberal government had for the hunting and fishing communities. This 15 years of neglect created an unfair moose tag draw system that failed to meet the needs of the hunting community and the tour tourism industry in Northern Ontario. The previous government had years to repair a well-known problem, but instead chose to ignore the issue and focus on raising taxes for Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, the draw needs to be fixed so that the hunt can benefit hunters and our northern communities by supporting tourism and small businesses. Can the minister update the House on what steps are being taken to ensure that future moose tag draws will be done in a fair manner? The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. Speaker, our government for the people has listened to the concerns of hunters, and my ministry is reviewing Ontario's approach to managing moose. We will work with an advisory committee, which will review moose management, including the tag draw system, with the intention of making it fair, more accessible, and simpler for hunters. As the review unfolds, we will continue to listen and engage hunters and stakeholders to inform future decisions on how tag quotas are developed and distributed. We will investigate new and improved ways of meeting the needs of hunters with continued hunting opportunities. The member is correct. The system needs to be fixed. My ministry will provide the solutions necessary so that we can finally have a moose management approach that works to the benefit of hunters, businesses, and our northern communities. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Thank you to the minister for that answer. Mr. Speaker, I know that it will be reassuring to both my constituents as well as to those in our rural and remote communities to know that they finally have a government that works for the people. The current situation is a personal one for a lot of Ontarians who are avid hunters and use the moose tag system Stop frequently. Fixing the moose tag draw will be to the benefit of hunters all across Ontario, and I'm sure they are eager to know when they can expect to see the results of the review from the committee. Can the minister provide a timeline of when the review will be completed? It's not working for the minister. Well, thank you again to the member, and I, I will want, I'm glad to hear that she agrees that the review will bring relief to the member's constituents and to Ontarians across the province. The Ontario Moose Bear Allocation Advisory Committee is typically made up of six members with related experience appointed by the Public Appointment Secretariat. As part of an, our overall review, we will revamp the advisory committee to make sure they are set up for a thorough review of Ontario's moose management system. I also want to reiterate what I said in my previous answer. Throughout the review, my ministry will continue to engage and listen to the concerns of hunters and other stakeholders so that our new approach is one that works for the people and actually addresses the problem. Mm -hmm. As the member knows, the current system is quite complex. The advisory committee will work over the next two years to ensure that we get this right and that we finally have a moose Response. management system to make moose hunting fair and more accessible. Thank you, Speaker. Next 
question. The member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Energy. There are serious questions about OPG's sale of the Hearn Generating Station the government needs to answer. We know that when the Premier was a city councillor, he met behind closed doors with developers to cook up a vision for Toronto's waterfront. That vision included an NFL stadium on the Hearn site, then controlled by Mario Cortellucci, a major donor and fundraiser for the PC party and the Ford family. Wow. Mr. Cortellucci's group has acquired the site at a suspiciously low price. Has the Premier or his staff had any discussions with developers or OPG about the Hearn site since he became Premier, and if so, what did he discuss or promise? Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ontario Power Generation operates at arm's length from the Government of Ontario, and it's responsible for its own operational decisions. Studios of America has leased this land since 2002. The terms of their lease included the first right of offer to purchase the land if it ever became for sale. By divesting this land, OPG has shielded taxpayers from any long-term environmental liabilities associated with a former coal-generating station. This decision is in the best interest of taxpayers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Minister of Energy. That was a very cautious answer. <laughs> During the last PC government, there was scandal after scandal, where insiders were able to buy government properties cheap and flip them for a massive profit. Several employees of the Ontario Realty Corporation were charged and convicted. In yet another scandal, the Conservatives appointed the party official who controlled their donations to be CEO of the Ontario Pension Board. The official then approved $36.3 million in cheap loans to the top donor of the PC party. That donor was Mario Cortellucci. Oh. It's time to clear the air. Will the Premier, will the government allow an independent evaluation of the Hearn property so we can determine if this deal was fair? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This decision is in the best interest of taxpayers. By divesting this land, OPG has shielded taxpayers from any long-term environmental protection associated with a former coal-generating station. Studios of America has leased this land since 2002, and the terms of the lease included the first right of offer to purchase the Charles land that came for order. sale. Ontario Power Generation operates at arm's length from the government Niagara of Falls, Ontario and is responsible for, for Hamilton West and Custer Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Double headers are full time professional firefighters who also provide volunteer services. Minister, I understand that many rural and small municipalities rely on double headers to protect local homes, families, and businesses. For many years, almost two decades, in fact, double headers who volunteer in small rural communities as firefighters have faced the potential of disciplinary action and even threats to their full-time jobs because of how they choose to volunteer in their free time. Many of these double-headers have been forced to stop volunteering for fear of fines and disciplinary action. Can the minister to this house can the minister explain to this House what the government is doing with regards to double headers and how this will benefit the many communities relying on these volunteers to stay safe? Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank, I'd like to thank the member from Mississauga East Cooksville for his uh, tireless work in his community. And, Mr. Speaker, one of the first 
speeches I gave right here in this legislature was on the importance of protecting public safety and the need to protect our professional firefighters who, in their free time, act as volunteer firefighters in their communities. These heroic double-hatters are some of my community's most dedicated volunteers. They are protecting their neighbors' lives and homes. Through Bill 57, our government is enshrining the right of our professional firefighters to volunteer their time whenever they want and wherever they want. Hundreds, <laughs> hundreds, if not thousands, of Ontario's professional firefighters Response. are double-hatting. These amendments will allow municipalities to resist any pressure to dismiss professional firefighters for double-hatting and ensure that they do not face penalties for choosing to serve their communities as a volunteer firefighter. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, uh, for that explanation. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, it seems not only strange but also wrong that firefighters would face disciplinary action and persecution for choosing to volunteer as firefighters in their own communities. We know that double-headers care deeply for the health and safety of their communities and that fire chiefs across rural Ontario depend on their double-headers to provide training and mentoring to other volunteer firefighters. Can the minister tell us what this government is doing to permanently protect professional firefighters who are keeping our communities safe in rural Ontario? Here, here. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have waited 15 years for the province to take action. And, and if passed, our changes will prohibit associations from dis disciplining members for double hatting, allow municipalities to resist any pressure to dismiss double hatters, ensure that professional firefighters cannot face association penalties for double hatting, and perhaps most importantly, our legislation will apply those protections retrospectively. Today in Ontario, there are 18,000 volunteer, 11,000 full-time and 600 part-time firefighters. In other words, Mr. Speaker, 60 per cent of Ontario's firefighters are volunteers. I am hopeful that Bill 57 may not only protect today's double hatters, but will also welcome back firefighters who found other outlets for their volunteer community service. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of that piece of legislation. Start the clock. Next question, member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Yesterday, I asked the Minister about how the government's changes to social assistance will hurt Ontarians with disabilities. The plan includes zero support for Ontarians with disabilities who cannot work, and it will take more money out of the pockets of people who are able to work, because the more they make, the more gets clawed back. To quote the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty, forcing people off social assistance while depressing work conditions in the midst of a housing crisis won't move people out of poverty. Will the minister explain how taking more money out of the pockets of working people and offering nothing to those who can't work at all will eliminate poverty in Ontario? gets her information, but this was the first government in 15 years at the same time to raise 1.5 percent increases across the board in Ontario Works and at ODSP at the same time. We've also brought in a lift from the fall economic statement that's going to make sure people will keep more of their hard-earned money and they're probably won't have to. What I announced last week that those who are in Ontario Disability Supports, they will end up seeing more order. wraparound services than they've ever seen. They will come out further ahead than they've ever Mountain been, and order. those who can work on Ontario Works will be making sure that they have the supports in place. But don't take my word for it. Take Paul Johnson from the City of Hamilton's General Manager of Health and Safe Communities. He said the City of Hamilton has undertaken an integrated approach to services and will work with the province to reduce the administrative burden on those who provide social assistance, thereby 
ensuring more time is spent on those we serve. Or we could talk Spons. to Michael Allen from the United Way, who said today's announcement signals Minister McLeod's intention to evolve Ontario's social assistance system to more effectively serve the needs of the vulnerable people and interrupt the cycle of poverty. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Back to the minister. The changes to the earnings threshold will be a disincentive to work because the more you make, the more the government will claw back. If you are on ODSP but able to work and earn more than $500 a month, you will only be able to keep 25 cents on the dollar. The same goes for Ontario Works if you earn more than $300 a month. Trish Herkulak, a social assistance recipient in Scarborough, someone that the minister wasn't actually interested in talking to, is the recipient. Trish told the CBC, and I quote, recipients are going to end up with what they had before. It's not going to help them. It's, not, it's going to keep them impoverished. And the minister likes to talk about the 1.5% increase, which actually amounts to, if you qualify for maximum benefit, $11.50 a month for Ontario Works Whoa. and $17.50 a month Question. for ODSP. Does the minister think it's fair if she only got to keep 25 cents of every dollar she worked for, and does she think she could live above the poverty line by only keeping 25 cents of every dollar that she earns? Minister. I am going to reject that question out of hand. It is factually incorrect, and the member opposite knows it. All she's doing is trying to scaremonger Ontario's most vulnerable people. Here are the statistics. We have one million people on social assistance in this province. It costs $10 billion, yet still one Order. out of seven people are trapped in a cycle of poverty because of a disjointed patchwork system that did nothing to stabilize their lives Mountain, or get them Order. back on track. And that's why I'm pleased to have the endorsement of Paper Windsor West, Colada, the Senior Order. Vice President of Community Impact and Strategy of the United Way of Greater Toronto, who says a more client centered, locally driven approach with focus on investment and wraparound supports and coordination among services and sectors is essential for building the pathways to economic opportunity. I've said it once before, I'll say it once again, the best program in this province Response. is a job. Order. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. There's still a member who wants to ask a question. Out of respect for him, the House will come to order. Start the clock. Member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Honourable Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. In Ontario, we look out for each other, neighbours helping neighbours, demonstrating compassion when those in vulnerable circumstances need help the most. Ontario's social safety net was built in this premise, North, a to premise order. of compassion and dignity. But today, one in seven Ontarians are living in poverty, and after 15 years of mismanagement, our social assistance system has become a patchwork of programs and services that trap people in a cycle of poverty. Minister, last week you unveiled your plan to reform Ontario's social assistance system and get our people working. Can you please tell this House how you are restoring dignity and compassion for those who need it most. Good question. Good question. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. What a great question, respectful to the point, and actually acknowledging the true facts of where we are in the province of Ontario today. Let me be perfectly clear. 
Ontario's plan for so social assistance no, no. is focused on the Crystal people clear. that are in the most vulnerable circumstances in our province. For those who can work, we are providing them a path out of poverty. For those who cannot work, they will receive better and more compassionate support, which has been identified by many of our stakeholders across Ontario. Those with, uh, with disabilities, we will ensure that they are living with dignity. We will consolidate ODSP supplements and benefits into simplified financial supports to, so frontline staff can easily connect to clients to support them. We'll also institute a $6,000 flat annual earnings exemption, Speaker, plus a 25 percent exemption for earnings Response. over that limit, and we will cut red tape and restore accountability. Right we need to dignitize services to make program delivery more efficient. Thank you very much. That concludes question period for today. There being no deferred votes, this House is recessed until three. Oh, just a second. Point of order. Point of order. The member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. I'm uh, very pleased uh, to just take a moment and introduce uh, a great individual from Scarborough. I uh, see here today, Trustee Nancy Crawford from the Toronto Catholic District School Board. Thank you. I'll try it once again. This house stands in recess now until 3 p.m.